Hi, this lesson is on the nature of statistics. And basically we'll be going through some common terms that you're going to be hearing throughout statistics that you'll need to be really familiar with. It might be helpful to you as you learn these to grab your textbook and maybe fill these out ahead of time, use your textbook to go through these definitions and fill them out. Um, if you don't have your textbook, then just follow along. So one of the two of the main words that you're going to hear over and over and over again through every chapter of statistics or every unit of statistics is population and sample. And these are really important. A population is the set of all subjects in the study or under observation. So anytime you're reading something, if it says all, then that means we're talking about the population. Now the sample is a portion or sum of the population. So it's a chosen group that we are studying that is pulled from the population. Now these are important because oftentimes the population is way too big in order to study the entire thing. So instead of trying to gather data and on the entire population, we pull a sample from the population that we can study instead. And here's a visual of what I am talking about here. So hopefully that can help you see kind of what's going on. We have a big group of people or subjects. It may not be people, it might be cats or something like that. And then we're pulling, hopefully, a representative sample from the population to help us get an idea of what our population actually looks like. So the population, if we're trying to gather data on the population, but it's too big, we can pull a section out of the population and study those subjects instead. And hopefully those few subjects that we pulled properly represent the population that we're studying. In addition to that, there are two types of studies that we use the population and samples for. Those are observational, I'm sorry, descriptive, I jumped ahead, sorry about that. Descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. And the difference between these two is, it's kind of common sense from the name, but descriptive statistics are only used to describe a sample. So these are normally numbers. Um, when we say descriptive statistics, those are usually referring to numbers like mean, median, mode, standard deviation. So these are numerical values used to describe, which makes sense, a sample. So they're just numbers that are describing the sample that we pulled. And then inferential statistics are numerical values that we use to make predictions about the population based on the sample. So really the first part of the semester, we're gonna be just studying how to find descriptive statistics. And then later in the semester, we will use the descriptive statistics to make inferences about a population. So numerical values used to draw conclusions or make inferences about a population based on the sample. So really you have, if you're trying to tell the difference between the two, uh, if one is just describing the sample, that's descriptive. And if one is making conclusions about the population, that's inferential. And then there's two types of studies. There's an observational study 
and a designed experiment. An observational study is probably the most common because it's easier to do, it's easier to design. An observational study is a study in which nothing is imposed on the subjects. The subjects under consideration are simply observed and usually in their like natural habitat. <laughs> so for example, um, an observational study might be, uh, maybe you're standing at the front of the school and you take the temperature of everyone who walks into the school at a given time. So you're not necessarily making someone do anything you're just taking their temperature and you're observing what their temperatures are. Or even, this one's kind of weird, but if you stand in a bathroom, make sure you're in the bathroom that you belong in and you're standing in your bathroom and you watch, you take note of how many people wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. So that one's a little iffy because if someone's standing there, people might feel pressured to wash their hands when they normally don't. But if you're kind of incognito, just hanging out or whatever, I don't know, that's kind of weird. But <laughs> if you're just hanging out and you count how many people wash their hands out of the total number of people that go through the bathroom, that's an observational study. You're not imposing anything on anyone. You're just observing what people do and you have numerical values based on the study. A designed experiment is much more controlled. A designed experiment is where something like a, whoops, I spelled that wrong. Like a drug, like an experimental drug, medical drug, is imposed on a specific group of subjects. And this is very controlled, very particular, very organized. Um, they're much harder to come by because designed experiments are really hard to um, set up, basically. And there's always a treatment and control group. And basically what happens here is you have a group of people and ideally, or subjects, whatever it is, mice, whatever, um, ideally, all the subjects in this group that you're studying are very similar in nature. And this is what I mean by it has to be controlled because let's say uh, you wanna study a weight loss drug and you wanna see if it works or not. Well, it doesn't really make sense to pull a group of men and women of all different ages because depending on your age, your weight, your height, your existing health conditions, this weight loss program might affect you differently. And the results we see may be based on, maybe due to something else. And we call that a confounding variable. When there's a variable introduced to the experiment that might change the results or affect the results, we call it a confounding variable. So it is, the purpose of a designed experiment is to eliminate as many confounding variables as possible so that we can see that the results were truly due to what was imposed. So if it's a weight loss program, then maybe your group would be um, healthy males between 20 and 29. Uh, maybe they all weigh the same. Maybe they all have the same lifestyle. Maybe they are all the same height. Maybe, you know, maybe they don't have any pre-existing conditions, maybe non-smokers. You have all these qualifications on this group and you impose a weight loss program on them. And then if the weight loss program works, then you can confidently say with a certain percentage, you can confidently say that these people lost weight because of the treatment imposed on them. And basically what happens is you break your big group into two different groups, treatment and control. And the treatment group gets the treatment and the control group does not get the treatment. But both groups don't know whether they got the treatment or not. So this is where the idea of a placebo pill comes in. So maybe it's a weight loss pill. And 
um, basically you have treatment and control and both groups get a pill. They may not know which pill they're getting, but they both get a pill. And then that way that eliminates the confounding variable of like psychological um, bias. Basically, if you know you're getting a weight loss pill, then you might be more motivated to lose weight because you want the pill to work. Whereas if you don't know what kind of pill you're getting, then you're not gonna have that uh, confounding variable of knowing whether you have it or not. So everyone gets a pill. Treatment is they get the actual pill. Control is they don't get the actual pill. And then if there is a change in the treatment group and not a change in the control group, then we can say that the difference between the two groups is because of the treatment imposed. So it's all very involved. It's really cool. I really love it. Um, hopefully that all makes sense, but the treatment gets the um, drug or treatment, whatever it is, might be a workout program. And the control group does not. But in um, a blind experiment, the control group doesn't know that they're not getting it. And then in a double blind experiment, the people imposing and the people receiving don't know. And then that way it prevents, like if the doctors know that their group is getting the drug, then they may treat them differently than the group who's not getting the drug. And so we call that a double blind experiment when the doctors don't even know. Uh, there's an episode in Grey's Anatomy where they're doing um, an experiment for dementia patients and they're trying to see if something works and they have a treatment group and a control group and nobody knows who gets what. It's a double blind experiment. Well, Meredith goes in and she looks at who's getting the treatment so that she can switch it. And they basically had to throw the entire experiment out because she ruined it because she looked. So it's very important that uh, everyone remains blind to that. There's one example in a statistics book I was reading where uh, the patients were getting brain surgery. And I'm like, how do you impose, how do the people who don't get the brain surgery, how do you keep them <laughs> blind to it? But basically every single subject got the surgery. So every single subject went under anesthesia. They all got cut on, but only half of the group, the treatment group actually got worked on. But everyone who woke up felt like they had the surgery and they were blind to whether they actually got worked on or not. So it's all very, very cool, very neat. Um, another example of a design or um, something that can be imposed would be when vaccinations are created and they have not been tested yet, then they will have a bunch of people volunteer to receive the vaccination and then the more people that volunteer to receive a vaccination, the more data that is gathered. And they can make adjustments to vaccinations as more people uh, display unsavory side effects from vaccinations. I won't get into that. Let's move on. Um, something really important that we need to note about observational studies is that observational studies can reveal only association whereas designed experiments can help establish causation. You cannot draw cause and effect conclusions from observational studies. In observational studies, there are way too many confounding variables to confidently draw a cause and effect relationship between variables. So for example, the bathroom uh, situation that I explained, if you're in a bathroom and you're watching and the people know that you're watching, then they may wash their hands even though they don't normally. Whereas in a de design, so there might be confounding variables there and we can't necessarily say this caused this or the effect of this was that, but we can see association. These might be closely related. Whereas a designed experiment, since it's so controlled, then those are the types of experiments or studies that you can draw cause and effect relationships from. I have examples down here. Do me a favor and pause it and read the examples and decide which one is which, observational study or designed experiment. 
Hopefully you paused it. This one should be pretty straightforward. Uh, on the left, this is actually a true story. You can look up studies on this, the Salk vaccine. His name was Jonas Salk and he came up with this vaccine. In the 1940s and 1950s, the public was extremely concerned with the outbreak of polio. To prevent the disease, Jonas Salk developed a polio vaccine. In a test involving nearly 2 million grade school children, half received an injection with the vaccine in it and half received, received a placebo vaccine. So they all got the vaccine, but half got the true vaccine and half didn't. From the study, they found that children that received the vaccination were less likely to contract polio. Researchers concluded that the vaccine was affected in preventing polio. What kind of study is this? Uh, this one's pretty straightforward. We have a designed experiment where there's a treatment and a control. <clears throat> the treatment actually got the vaccine and the control didn't. This is a designed experiment. Whoops. Where the population would have been um, all the children in the world. <clears throat> and the sample would be the 2 million grade school children that got the vaccine. Which leaves the next one, uh, an investigation involving 3,800 people older than 65 of at, um, years of age found that lefties and righties died at exactly the same rate. What kind of study is this? Basically back in the day, they viewed left-handedness as a disability or as like a, a, fall, uh, you, a flaw. And so they did a bunch of studies to see if it really mattered. And basically they found out that it didn't. And so um, this would be an observational study because they didn't impose left-handedness on anybody. They simply just watched to see uh, who was left-handed, who wasn't, and then the age at which they died. So this was observational where the population would be um, maybe all people older than 65, and then the sample would be the 3,800 people that were chosen. So that's all I have for this lesson. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please let me know, and I'd be happy to help. See you in the next one.